Welcome to 10 Minute KQL. Whether you're a technology pro looking to master the Custo query language or new to the world of IT and looking to learn your first language, 10 Minute KQL is a place to level up your skills. This is the fourth session in the Custo query language beginner series. This series is intended to take you from a level with minimal technical experience to writing your first queries using the KQL language. These short 10 minute sessions will teach you KQL, allow you to get hands-on practice in a lab environment, and provide some homework to practice after the session. In the last session, we wrote our first KQL queries using where and take and learned about the pipe character. In today's session, we'll focus on KQL syntax, or the rules of the KQL language, as well as ways to structure your queries. If you find value in these videos, please hit the like button. And if you want to receive notifications of new videos, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. The first rule in KQL syntax is that the language is generally case sensitive, with a few exceptions that we'll talk about in more detail in the next session. The second thing to know about KQL is that spaces are generally not relevant. If I place three spaces between take and 10 and run the command, it works fine. And if I take away the space between the pipe and take, it also works fine. There are some exceptions to this rule, and some applications have their own exceptions, but this is a general rule that applies in many, but not all situations. I can also run many commands and many pipes from one line, and it'll work just fine. It's best practice, however, to place each new pipe on a new line for ease of readability and debugging. In KQL, you can use a double slash for commenting. This helps both you and others that may use your query to understand the purpose or what's occurring in individual lines in the query that may be confusing. Anything after the double slashes on a single line will not be taken as a command and will turn green. You can also comment out an entire line by placing a double slash at the beginning of the line. This can be helpful when testing different statements and fine-tuning queries. Something to understand about the syntax are things called comparison operators. We already saw one of these with the double equals. That means an exact match. In KQL, the not symbol is the exclamation mark. In this example, we want to see all records with a city name field of Seattle. If we wanted to see all the records with a city name excluding Seattle, we can use the combination of the exclamation point and equal sign. You can think of it as not equals to or doesn't equals for whatever's in the quotes. In KQL, the tilde symbol is in the upper left of most keyboards and represents something being not case sensitive. So if we use equal and the tilde symbol, then whatever's in the quotes can be used regardless of the case of the individual letters. In this example, we want to find all the customers named Peter with either lowercase or uppercase letters. Keep in mind that we can't skip lines in our query, otherwise it's recognized as a new query. I now have two queries and I want to run one of them. I can simply place the cursor anywhere in a query and it will highlight that query. It will then run the highlighted sections. This way we can have multiple queries in one place or we can simply open a new tab and start with a fresh querying space for writing. When we use quotes around strings, we can use either single or double quotes. If anywhere in the string itself has a single quote as part of the string, then double quotes must be used. When in doubt, try a double quote. When we think about the structure of KQL queries, it's important to remember how the pipe function works. If we start with a table, and we take 10 from that table by using the pipe, we expect to start with a full data set and end with 10 random rows from the table. 
What would happen if we placed an extra pipe and wear statement below take 10? Since the current output is the viewable data set with 10 random records, the where statement would only apply to the 10 records in the input data set and not the original table. This is important because changing the order of lines can change the output of the query. Also, if the table does not contain the number of records we're requesting by using take, the number of records produced will be the maximum number in the table. This also applies when using take after filtering the table. If only three records remain after using where statements, and we try to take 10 records, only three will display. There are many formats to writing an efficient query, but generally you want to remove as much information from the data set as early as possible in your query. You'll find that some systems throttle queries and limit the speed that queries can be run, so optimizing your query to use the least amount of resources is best practice. In our previous examples, we place quotes around strings. One thing that we do not place quotes around are names of fields. Although we haven't shown examples of all these items yet, here's one framework that can help you optimize querying. If our query has variables, we can declare them first, and then we can declare our table name. We want to filter early and often, usually starting with date time filters. We can then add event filters such as where. Lastly, we'll shape our data and make it presentable. We can do this by selecting only the fields that we want, displaying in charts and graphs, or sampling the data. We haven't given practical examples of many of these terms yet, and it's just a glimpse at upcoming lessons in both the beginner and intermediate series. But this can be helpful for those with prior language knowledge. One other note for query optimization that we'll discuss more in the intermediate series are joins. When you join two or more data sets together, you should consider filtering as much as possible before the join to make the query more efficient. This is an example query of what you should be able to write after completing both the beginner and intermediate series. While it has concepts we haven't discussed yet, it provides a sneak peek of what's to come and shows one way to format your queries as you progress. The top line sets a variable named college so later when called, it will filter out any customers that don't have any of these three levels of education. Line two, we know well, we're simply identifying our first data set. Line three, we also know well, we're filtering for only customers with the first name of Peter from the first data set. On line four, while we could have added an additional where statement here calling for our education variable, we used and. This is simply an additional filter. Line 5 begins the process to join a second data set. Line 6 identifies a second data set. Line 7 filters the dates of purchases found in the second data set. Line 8 identifies the field that will be used as a key to join the two data sets. Line 9 sorts the output in alphabetical order based on the customer's last name. Line 10 selects only the fields of interest and removes all other fields while allowing us to reorder and rename the fields to something more presentable. For this week's homework assignment, try to write a query that uses the not equals to combination. Write your query in a way that's easy to use by others based on the examples from previous lessons. You can post your query and results in the comments section to learn with and help others. That's all for today's session. In the next video in the beginner series, we'll introduce has, contains, starts with, and ends with. These help us in our filtering process. If you find value in these videos, please support the channel by hitting the like button. And if you want to receive notifications of new videos, hit the subscribe button with the notification bell.